so this this idea of expository apologetics uh, first let's define what we're talking about when we say apologetics Cornelius Van Til gives a, a, a broad definition of apologetics that I find very helpful he argues that apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of the non-Christian philosophy of life what I really appreciate about this definition is that basically he boils all worldviews in the world down to two worldviews. There's the Christian worldview and the non-Christian worldview. There's various forms of a non-Christian worldview, but ultimately we're dealing with a non-Christian worldview, somebody who's rejecting God's truth. It's also the vindication of Christian philosophy, the, the Christian philosophy of life. It's not necessarily the vindication of me. And, and oftentimes in apologetics, that's what we want to do. I want to vindicate me. I want to get in an argument with you, and I want to win. Can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. <laughs> apologetics in its simply form is merely knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate that to others effectively. Again, knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate that to others effectively, essentially, is what we're talking about when we talk about apologetics. Um, our, our view of apologetics, um, we believe that apologetics is for elite Christians. We believe that apologetics requires knowledge of science, philosophy, logic, debate, etc., I believe apologetics requires intimate knowledge of cults and heresies, that it requires an edge of confidence, even arrogance. That's why most of the people who are interested in apologetics are teenage boys. <laughs> you know, they, they belong to debate clubs and all this sort of thing, and they just want to debate. And we believe apologetics is just all about debate. It's acquire information and argue your side. And it's basically this view that keeps us from doing apologetics. Because your average Christian is not here. Your average Christian doesn't think of, of him or herself as being elite. N doesn't believe. I mean, you can have a degree in, you know, science and philosophy, logic, debate. Well, you can have a degree in one of these things. And still... I know Christian people with degrees in philosophy who just feel like they're just not quite knowledgeable enough for apologetics, um, that it requires an intimate knowledge of, uh, and familiarity with cults and heresies. You know how many cults and heresies there are? You're wrong. Because even if you had an accurate number when I asked you the question, somebody just started one and, and, and you didn't add it, okay? And that edge of confidence and arrogance, we'll talk about that momentarily. The biblical case for apologetics. The Bible talks about apologetics throughout. For example, in the, in the plagues, you know, we were, we're preaching through Exodus right now. We've taken a, a bit of a break, a bit of a hiatus to deal with um, the Lord's Supper because now we've come through the plagues, we've come through the last plague, and you know, you get to the last plague, the death of the firstborn, and the Passover, um, and so we're talking about the connection between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. But you, you get to this whole idea of the plagues themselves, and here in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16, God says, but for this purpose I have raised you up, speaking of Pharaoh, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. One of the purposes for Israel's time in Egypt, one of the purposes for the plagues, by the way, it did not take 10 plagues. Amen, somebody. It did not take 10. God was not in heaven going, oh, okay, I'm going to try this now. Oh, he didn't do, okay, I'm going to, you know, he, he, he knew Pharaoh's going to harden his heart. I'm going to go to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to harden his heart. On the last plague, he says, um, this is going to be the last plague. On this plague, he's not just going to let you go, he's going to drive you out. 
could have done that the first time. But he didn't do that the first time. Why? Because part of the purpose was an apologetic purpose. He wanted to demonstrate his superiority over all of the gods of Egypt. Not just for the Egyptians, and not just for the rest of the watching world, but also for Israel. Because Israel had been there hundreds of years, and he did not want to take them out of Egypt without taking Egypt out of them. And so he engaged in apologetics. Titus 1.9, apologetics and pastoral ministry. We think oh, only certain people, only certain pastors have to be apologists. Really? Titus 1.9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. Apologetics is required for every elder. Every elder must be an apologist. If you're not an apologist, you're not qualified for pastoral ministry. I, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it, okay? <laughs> and that's what the book says. You must be able to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. That's apologetics in its simplest form. But also every believer. So for those who say, okay, fine. If you have to, you know, have apologetics in order to be an elder, I'll just leave the eldership. <laughs> you got to leave Jesus. <laughs> you got to stop being a Christian. 1 Peter 3.15 but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's every believer. Every believer is commanded to be an apologist. Not just there. In Jude 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. To agonize greatly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This contending is apologetics. She can't just leave the eldership. You got to leave the body of Christ if you don't want to be responsible for being an apologist. So what's expository apologetics? Three key characteristics of expository apologetics. Biblical, simple, conversational. It, it, the idea is if we are all called to be apologists, then what we engage in has to be biblical. We've got, we got to use the power of the word, okay? Hence the term expository. It's got to be simple. If it's not simple, we're not going to do it. Amen, somebody. If it's complicated and you think engaging in apologetics is all complicated, you're just not going to do it. It's just too hard. Somebody will say something and you'll be like, you know what, I need to refute that. But it's just hard. And then in all this time I've been thinking about it, now it's gone. And it'd be rude for me to bring it up again. Maybe next time. You'll never do it. It's got to be conversational. We've got to engage people. You got to engage people. I'll never forget, as a new believer, um, I had just come to faith in Christ. Never heard the gospel until I got to, to college. Didn't know much about anything. Um, I, I was raised by my mother, who was a practicing Buddhist. So Buddhism was really the only religion and spirituality that I knew. So here I'm converted my first year at university. I have some teammates of mine who discipled me. And um, I'm living off campus, and some people come and knock on my door. And I come back to these two teammates of mine who they, they had bought me my first Bible, taught me how to read it, all this other sort of stuff. I said, man, these guys came to my door and we had an interesting conversation. How many guys? It was two of them. I said, okay. Did they have name tags and call one another elder? I said, no, why? It was the JWs. I said, how do you know? Because it wasn't the Mormons. If it wasn't the Mormons, it was the JWs. The Mormons would have had name tags, and they would have introduced themselves as elder. If they didn't do that, it was the JWs. Okay, who are the JWs? The Jehovah's Witnesses. What did they say? Until so they talked about all this. So I went to the library, and I did more research than I did for any paper that I wrote in college. <laughs> I'm kind of ashamed to admit that, but not really. Um, so I was, I was all over this. 
And because they told me, you know, they were like, how'd the conversation go? I was like, it went well. They asked you questions you couldn't answer. Yep, they'll be back. How do you know? Because they're Jehovah's Witnesses, and they ask you questions that you couldn't answer. They'll be back. So I was like, okay, they come back. I'll be ready. They came back. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> Intellectually, I just commenced to whooping them like tied up goats. I mean, it was just, it was awful. It really was. I was telling them stuff about their own religion they didn't even know. It was awful. So I come back and I tell them, I'm telling my boys, I'm like, man, it was, you should have been there. And they, they said this, and then I said that, and then they brought up this, and I brought up that, and then they couldn't answer questions. I said, y'all need to get on the phone and call Brooklyn, because that's where all your answers come. And it was like, it was awesome. <laughs> and so Brent Napton, one of the gentlest men I ever met, godly man, he looks at me and he says, do you think they'll ever come back? And I said, no, man, they ain't never coming back. And he said, what a pity. And he turned around and walked away. I didn't like him. <laughs> See, I was combative, not conversational. I didn't care about them as individuals, and they could tell I didn't care about them as individuals. All I cared about was vanquishing a foe. So there was no conversation. And here's what's ironic. You and I hate it when people do that to us. If they come to us and there's somebody who's, a, you know, a, a, a Muslim or somebody who's a, a Buddhist or Hindu or whatever, and they start talking to you about your worship of the Virgin Mary, and they start talking to you about, you know, how you follow the Pope, and, you know, you sit there and you go, dude, don't you know anything? I'm not Catholic. I don't believe that stuff. But how often do we do that to other people? Because we read a book about what so-and-so group believes. We meet someone who carries that title, and then we start ascribing to them the beliefs that we read about. That's exactly, exactly what people do to us, and we hate it. And we don't hear what they have to say. Because we're not being treated like an individual. This process has got to be conversational. The limited and limiting nature of the gospel are really the foundation upon which expository apologetics is built. Because again, it's about exposition. It's about using the scripture. Folks, the canon is closed. Amen belong right there, y'all. We're at the G3. We're at the G3 conference. <laughs> Let me try that again. The canon is closed. Amen. A amen. Thank you. There is no new revelation, okay? There is no new revelation. There is no new revelation. We're not getting more revelation, okay? In fact, the revelation that we have is more for you to digest in multiple lifetimes. You don't need nothing else. You're, you're good, right? So Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Deuteronomy 12, 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Proverbs 36, I love this one. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Like it's not enough that he rebuke you. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, by his son, that there's his final, ultimate revelation to us, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Revelation 22, 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Therefore, since that's true, there are a limited number of things we believe. Okay? F follow me on this. There's a limited number of things we believe, right? Because we got a Bible. We aren't getting new revelation. So the number of things that we believe are limited. We have a limit. There are a limited number of objections that can be raised. 
Fair enough? There's a limited number of objections that can be raised. Uh, a limited number of objections that we must answer and a source for those answers, which is the Bible. Hence, expository apologetics. Okay? Can we follow this? Because of the limited and limiting nature of the gospel, these things are true. Limited number of things that we believe. Limited number of objections that can be raised because those objections have to be related to what we believe. Limited number of objections that we have to answer. And there's a source for those answers. The limiting nature of the gospel. If there are a limited number of objections to the gospel message, and these objections have been answered by biblical authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then their answers will certainly be more effective and authoritative than any we could devise on our own. What I believe comes from the Scriptures. Comes from the Bible, right? And the assertions about the things that I believe in the Bible were made under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Defenses of those things were given by individuals under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which means I don't need to invent defenses. I can go to the Scriptures. I'm not responsible for defending what I do not believe. I'm not responsible for defending what I do not believe. I'm also not responsible for defending heresy. So if somebody asks me about heresy, well, yeah, what about this? Well, that's heresy. I don't believe it. I don't have to offer a defense for that. You follow? So I don't need to know every heresy. I just need to know what I believe. Somebody asked me something about something I don't believe. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's like you asking me to defend, you know, well, yeah, oh, oh yeah, well, 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 well what, a, what about the way the Russians handle their, you, kind of, I'm kind of not a Russian. I don't. <laughs> Why would I defend how the Russians handle their whatever? Because I'm not one of them, right? Ask one of them. You want to ask me something about our stuff? I can answer it. But I don't have to answer stuff that's not our stuff. Thirdly, I'm not responsible for defending assumptions and straw men. I'm not responsible for defending assumptions and straw men. I'll just identify those as assumptions and straw men, you know? Yeah, well, well, you guys believe that, well, whatever, fill in the blanks. Whatever terrible thing we're being accused of this week. No, actually we don't. I don't believe that. You believe that? I don't believe that. In fact, I don't know anybody who believes that. In fact, I think you made that up. <laughs> In fact, I'm sure of it. I just took a poll. Nobody believes that. I'm not responsible for that, folks. The Apostle Paul was the original expository apologist. Again, using the Word of God as your source for answers to objections. Why? because the Word of God is your source for what you believe. Therefore, it is an authoritative and reliable source for defending what you believe. If you can't defend what you believe from the Word of God, then that means it probably didn't come from the Word of God and you probably shouldn't believe it. Amen, somebody. Amen. And there's some of that. There's a lot of that going on, you know? Why? Well, well, I, this is what I believe right here. Really? Defend that from the Word. Why? <laughs> I know it's in there. <laughs> I read it one time over second hesitations or something, <laughs> some one of those. And I... Folks, if you can't find it in the book, were these rhetorical devices? Because we know that Paul answered, especially in Romans, we know that he's answering these questions. He's answering objections. 
Were these just rhetorical devices? First, these questions flowed naturally. Secondly, they are common questions even to this day. I've had conversations with people, and I've stopped them and said, okay, hold on. Can I, can I, I need to show you something from the Bible. And let me just go ahead and get that one out of the way, because there's some of you who are thinking that, you know. Well, you know, you're talking about this expository apologetics, and that's great if you're talking to somebody who believes the Bible. But what if you're talking about somebody who doesn't believe the Bible? Then you've got to prove what you believe without using the Bible because they don't believe the Bible. Says who? Says who? They don't believe the Bible, so I don't use my Bible? That sounds like their rule. Why would I do that? You know what that sounds like to me? I, you know, I'm a, I'm a knight in medieval times, and I walk up to my opponent, like, unsheath my sword. And he looks at me and says, I don't believe in your sword. <laughs> Allow me to speak to thee about the science of metallurgy so that thou mayest believe in my sword. No! I don't believe in your sword. <laughs> Either he starts believing or you just win. <laughs> in fact, when we are arguing biblical truth with someone who doesn't believe the Bible, if we give up the Bible, they've just won because we've agreed with them that there is a source greater than the Bible and that we don't need the Bible for truth. The last thing you do is give up your Bible. Why on earth would I allow that person to dictate how God's truth is communicated? It's alive, it's active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So whatever I'm going to use that's not the Bible is not as authoritative or powerful as the Bible. Therefore, I do not relinquish it. Kind of like my guns and my kids. You know? And you ain't getting those. In fact, come for one, you probably get the other. Just saying. <laughs> Finally, if Paul had not heard these questions from others, they would most certainly have been questions with which he wrestled as a Jew embracing Christianity. So, let's look at a few of them. Questions concerning salvation. Romans 3, 3 to 4. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? And we get these questions. I've gotten this question. He says, by no means, meganoita, strongest no, meganoita, no, may it never be, by no means, let God be true, though everyone a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. He answers the question, he uses the scripture, he goes to Psalm 51, and he quotes it. Expository apologetics. You have an objection, I have an answer. You're asking me about what I believe. What I believe is based in Scripture. Therefore, my answer is based in Scripture. Five and six of chapter three. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I mean, we hear this all the time, do we not? You talk about the doctrines of grace, and people are basically arguing that God is unrighteous in inflicting his wrath upon the unrighteous. It's the same thing Paul dealt with. I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? Here he answers the question. He doesn't quote Scripture directly, but he does, however, allude to Scripture and use biblical truth. Sometimes you won't be able to remember book, chapter, and verse, but you remember biblical concepts. It's fine to answer with a biblical concept. It's what the apostle did. Verses 7 and 8, but if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? 
And why not do evil that good may come? I face this question. As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. By the way, he didn't answer that one. Why? Because it's a straw man. He says, that's slander. We don't believe that. Remember? Yeah, I don't have to defend what I don't believe. He just calls it slander and goes a step further. Their condemnation is God's going to get you for lying on us like that. You know we don't teach that. You know we don't believe that. That's not true. He answered later with the gospel. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus was put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He gets to the gospel, which is where we have to go. Chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. There's some people who need to hear this today because there are people right now today who are a part of the Hebrew Roots movement who believe that the Jews were better off and so they're going back to live like Jews. They need to read Galatians. Feast days, tassels on the clothing, the whole nine yards. Paul deals with it. Are the Jews better off? No, not at all. Not at all. You cannot be more holy by becoming Jewish. In fact, you are running away from the gospel. You're scandalizing the gospel. You're crucifying Christ again by putting those tassels on your clothes. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. He answers the question. He uses scripture. What follows in verses 10 through 18 is a series of quotes from Psalm 14, 1 through 3, Psalm 53, 1 through 3, Psalm 140, verse 3, Psalm 10, 7, Proverbs 1, 5, Isaiah 59, 7 and 8, and Psalm 36, 1. Bam, 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 bam. Scripture, scripture, scripture. That's expository apologetics, folks. This is what the apostle did. In rapid succession, Paul explains his understanding of man's sinful condition straight from Scripture. Acts 17, we see another example of expository apologetics expressed in a different way. With a Jewish audience, Acts 17, 1 to 3, there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scripture and explained, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and raise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And so he's explaining to them from the Scripture. He's doing exposition, clear exposition. But then when he gets to a Greek audience that doesn't necessarily know Scripture, he puts down his Bible. No, actually he doesn't. But he communicates it in a different way. For the sake of time, because I'm almost, I got to 840, right? 840, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, for the sake of time, we remember, we remember what he does here in Acts 17. God who made the world and everything in it. Here's what he does. Basically, he communicates the Christian worldview, meta narrative. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. He tells the Christian story, which is the overarching story of redemption from the beginning of the Bible to the end. So he's not doing specific exposition like he was doing when he was in the synagogue, but he still hasn't put down his Bible. He's still talking Bible. God created the world and everything in it, so on and so forth. Creeds, confessions, and catechism. This is the training ground for expository apologetics. I'm going to go faster here. Um, creeds. 
Creeds are among the earliest apologetics. Uh, creeds are summaries of the gospel. Creeds are poetic in nature so that they could be easy to memorize. Um, the Apostles' Creed, we have it again for the sake of time, we won't read it. Uh, the Nicene Creed and Arianism, again, dealing with a her the heresy. Um, how, do we do do how do we respond and equip people to respond, for example, to the Jehovah's Witnesses? It's the same heresy. Uh, the Athanasian Creed answers the Jehovah's Witness heresy. How do we respond to oneness Pentecostals? Same thing, the Athanasian Creed. So rather than trying to learn everything that we can about, you know, the, the oneness Pentecostals or Jehovah's Witnesses, so on and so forth, you can memorize the Athanasian Creed, which is probably not a bad idea, and then you've got an answer. You've got an answer. Because what are these creeds doing for us? They're summarizing Scripture. That's what they're doing. They're summarizing Scripture. And they were doing it at a time when specific doctrines were under attack so that they can become training grounds for dealing with those specific things. Confessions. Confessions unite believers. Distinguish Protestants from Rome. Distinguish Protestants from one another. Has origins in the New Testament. And are an essential disciple-making tool. Confessions are an essential disciple-making tool. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Summarize my teaching and pass it on. This is what confessions are doing. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells with us, within us, guard the deposit entrusted to you. That pattern of sound words, I would argue, is an allusion to confessionalism. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. So, again, some confessions of faith here and the history of those. Confessionalism and disciple-making. Listen to this from the preface of the Second London Baptist Confession. This is our church's confession of faith. This is the preface in the Second London Confession. And verily there is one spring and cause of the decay of religion in our day, which we cannot touch upon and earnestly urge a redress of. And that is the neglect of the worship of God in families by those whom the charge and conduct of them is committed. May not the gross ignorance and instability of many with the profaneness of others, be justly charged upon their parents and masters who have not trained them up in the way wherein they ought to walk when they were young, but have neglected those frequent and solemn commands which the Lord hath laid upon them so to catechize and instruct them that their tender years might be seasoned with the knowledge of the truth of God as revealed in the Scriptures." It all depends on how we define discipleship. Here's how we define discipleship today. Give them assurance of salvation. Teach them to have a quiet time. Show them how to evangelize and how to discover and employ their spiritual gifts. And you've been discipled. You don't know come here from Sikkim, but you've been discipled. Confessionalism and discipleship. There is standardized content. What do our disciples need to know? They need to know what we confess. The confession is basically a mini systematic theology. Here's what we believe. Fills in the gaps. Because anything else that you're doing, you're going to have tremendous gaps. That's why you're always asking other people, hey, what do y'all use for discipleship? Catechism. I've got just a couple minutes left. Catechisms are designed to teach confessions. So you write out your confession. That's a lot of stuff. How do you teach people all this stuff, especially children? Because we're trying to disciple our children, right? So you teach them the catechism so that through the catechism, they can build toward the knowledge of the confession. Catechisms are made for, li they're made for little ones. A lot of the catechisms are called catechisms for little ones. You know, we use a catechism for boys and girls when we start them off, before we move them to more complex catechisms, like the one that we heard today. 
You know, who made you? God made me. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. How can you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why ought you to glorify God? Because he made me and takes care of me. Are there more gods than one? There is only one. And how many persons does this one God exist? Three persons. Who are they? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Who is God? God is a spirit. Doesn't have a body like man. Where is God? God is everywhere. Can you see God? No, I cannot see God, but he always sees me. Does God know all things? Yes, nothing can be hidden from God. Can God do all things? Yes, God can do all his holy will. Where do you learn how to love and obey God? In the Bible alone. Who wrote the Bible? Holy men who were taught by the Holy Spirit. Who were our first parents? Adam and Eve. Of what were our first parents made? God made the body of Adam out of the ground, formed Eve from the body of Adam. What did God give Adam and Eve besides bodies? He gave them souls that will never die. Have you a soul as well as a body? Yes, I have a soul that will never die. How do you know you have a soul? Because the Bible tells me so. In what condition did God make Adam and Eve? Made them holy and happy. Did they stay holy and happy? Nope, they sinned against God. What is sin? Sin is any transgression of the law of God. What is meant by transgression? Doing what God forbids. What was the sin of our first parents? Eating the forbidden fruit. Why did they eat the forbidden fruit? They did not believe what God had said. Who tempted them to this sin? The devil tempted Eve and she gave the fruit to Adam. What happened to our parents when they had sinned? Instead of being holy and happy, they became sinful and miserable. What effect did the sin of Adam have on all mankind? All mankind is born in a state of sin and misery. What do we inherit from Adam as a result of this original sin? A sinful nature. What does every sin deserve? The anger and judgment of God. See, again, this is just like the first section of the Catechism for Boys and Girls. By the way, this is not for teenagers. This is for three- and four-year-olds. Do you realize how much theology I just covered with you? Have you any idea how much doctrine I just covered with you? This is discipleship. Yeah, well, you know, they're little children, and it's really just rote memorization, and we really don't want them to just be majoring on rote memorization. You know, we really want them to, we don't, we want them to know God and to love God. Oh, okay. So if you want them to know and love something, then you don't do rote memorization. Right. You want them to love reading? Yes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Why is it okay to use rote memorization for that? Two times one is two. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. Two times... Memorizing the timetables. Don't you want them to love math? It's ridiculous, and it's a lie from the pit of hell. This is discipleship, folks. By the way, catechism, simply defined, is learning what you believe through a series of questions and answers. What's apologetics? Answering questions about what you believe. The greatest apologetics training tool in the world catechism. Okay, we went fast at the end. I made my time just a few seconds over. Tomorrow, we will apply this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, for your word. Your word is truth. Grant by your grace that we might hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. Grant by your grace that we would always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks us the reason for the hope that is in us. And grant by your grace that we might do it with gentleness and with respect. Not that we might simply win arguments, but that we might win souls. So that Christ might indeed have the fullness of the reward for which he died. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen.